Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is June 14th, 2019, and my guest is author and business thinker Shoshana Zuboff. She joined the Harvard Business Faculty in 1981. One of the first tenured women at the school, she was the Charles Edward Wilson Professor of Business Administration. In 2014 and 2015, she was a faculty associate at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard Law School. Her latest book and the subject of today's episode is The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, The Fight for a Human Future at the New Frontier of Power. Shoshana, welcome to EconTalk. Thanks so much, Russ. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, What is surveillance capitalism? Well, let's begin with a definition of surveillance capitalism. Um, And for that, I'm going to provide a, a little bit of description for our listeners. One of the things I I write about is ways in which surveillance capitalism diverges from the history of of capitalism and some of its um, well-known elements. But there is a very important way in which surveillance capitalism emulates this history, and that's where I'd like to begin. So... Those who study capitalism have long described a process by which capitalism evolves claiming things that live outside the market dynamic and bringing them into the market dynamic, creating commodities that can be sold and purchased. So famously, industrial capitalism broadly speaking, claims nature for the market dynamic, reborn as real estate, as land that can be sold and purchased. Well, surveillance capitalism emulates this pattern, but with something that is an unexpected, unexpected and even dark twist. And that is surveillance capitalism claims private human experience for the market dynamic. And that private human experience is reinterpreted as a free source of raw material for translation into behavioral data. So this is how it works. These behavioral data, some of those flows are fed back to improve services, products, but there are other data streams that are hived off, and these are (laughs) selected for their rich predictive signals. And these parallel data streams are what I call behavioral surplus, because these are behavioral data that are more than what is required to improve services and products. These data streams, behavioral surplus with their rich predictive signals, are then flowing into supply chains. Think of pipes, think of conveyor belts that converge these data streams with the new means of production. The production facilities in this case are computational. They're what we refer to as machine intelligence, artificial intelligence. So now we have behavioral surplus with its rich predictive signals converging with advanced computational capabilities, production. And of course, out of this comes products. What are these products? These are computational products But the simplest way to describe them is that they are computational products that predict human behavior. I call them prediction products. Give us an example of that. Well, the the first and um, 
most uh, famous, widely known prediction product is what was called the click-through rate. The click-through rate, uh, we think of it as confined to online targeted advertising, but in fact, the click-through rate, uh, when you just zoom out a little bit, it's easy to see that it is a computational fragment that is a prediction of human behavior, where people are likely to click uh, on uh, uh, in relation to certain kinds of ad content. So the click-through rate was the first widely successful prediction product. In a similar way, uh, I draw an analogy to the invention of mass production a century ago, where the whole mass production logic of high volume and low unit cost, there were elements of this that you know, existed in, in a variety of different organizational settings, uh, even in the late 19th century. But the, the, whole, the whole comprehensive puzzle finally came together, the Ford Motor Company, early in the 20th century. And of course, the first great, most famous, uh, most successful product in mass production was the Model T Ford. Uh, and of course, looking back on it, it, it's obvious that the mass production, mass production as an economic logic was not limited to the Ford Motor Company or the fabrication of the Model T Ford. That was an economic logic that had legs. It could be applied to anything, and over time, it was applied to just about everything, from hospitals and schools to to factory production. Okay, so we have a similar situation now, where the click-through rate was the was the 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 Model T of this era, if you will the first wildly successful prediction product. Um, but surveillance capitalism is no more constrained to the online targeted advertising market than mass production was constrained to the Model T. So that's an example of a prediction product. And who buys these products? Well, these products are not fed back to the populations from which the raw material for their fabrication was initially derived. These products are sold to business customers who have an interest in what we will do not only now but soon and later. So these are business customers who have an interest in our future behavior and they constitute a new kind of marketplace that trades exclusively in human futures, prediction products. And again, the first well-established markets of, in this vein were the online targeted advertising markets, which as you know, have, have grown substantially, have produced a great deal of revenue uh, for uh, especially the, the two pioneering surveillance capitalists who pretty much own those markets still. Google and Facebook. Uh, I, I want to, you know, I agree with some of your concerns in this book. It's a book of concern, I would argue. Uh, <laughs> it, you're, it's a little bit frightening. Um, and I think there are things to be frightened about. But on the surface, uh, I, I want to at least start by pushing back. I'll, I'll agree with you some later on this. But what's wrong with that? So, for example, uh because of the data that I provide often unintentionally to Google or Facebook or Twitter or whoever, they know things about me. They know what I search for. They know what I buy, perhaps. If it's Amazon, they know a lot about what I buy. Uh, and so they are able to tailor what I see based on my behavior. They can sell the right to get access to my clicking uh, to other folks. And when that comes across my screen, I can choose to to buy it or not, it can be annoying. I, I bought a watch uh, this year, so I did a lot of searching for watches when I was still using Google. 
I still use now I use DuckDuckGo, but in those days I used Google. And, and so I started getting ads for watches, uh, most of which I wasn't interested in. And occasionally, um, maybe I looked at wait, one of them, I don't remember. But after I bought a watch, I kept getting the ads because they didn't know I bought the watch, um, either because they, quote, weren't paying attention, the algorithm doesn't know, or I think I, I bought it actually in a, a face-to-face store. I can't remember. But if I did, obviously that would might make it harder for them to know about it. And that was annoying, but it wasn't scary. And in fact, I could have been happy about it. Often when I travel, Google knows that I've, where I'm going because my Gmail has the receipt for the air, airfare and it'll suggest places to go to. I find that somewhat when I get there, I find that a little bit creepy um, and I don't um, and kind of cool that that they anticipate my my experiences, uh, but it I can choose to use it or not. So why does it, what are, what is frightening about this? Why is this a source of concern? Yeah, well, uh, let's, I like the word concern. Uh, you know, f- frightening is perhaps not the word that I would use in the sense of, you know, <laughs> Frightening is when uh, there's a knock on your door at three in the morning and, you know, the soldiers in jackboots are there to drag you away to the gulag or the concentration yep. camp. Uh, that's frightening. Yep. This, this is not that, Russ. This is a different form of power. And as you know, I, I go to some lengths to distinguish this power from you know, the kind of power that our world came face to face with in the 20th century when we confronted the totalitarian nightmares, both in Germany and in the Soviet Union. Uh, You know, totalitarianism is a form of power that rules by terror. But you paint a very very dark picture of of this, this turn in our economic activity. No, I do indeed, but my, my point here is that this is a, a little bit more, um, a, a little bit, it, it's it, grasping what's at stake here and what is of concern, you know, requires a, a different sensibility from pure fright <laughs> because, you know, in, 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 the, in the confrontation with totalitarian power, fright was essentially the means of social control. And that's not, that's not what's going on in this new world. The means of social control here, uh, you know, has to do with uh, dependency and um, identification and uh, the foreclosure of alternatives. There are, there are other uh, channels here uh, for social control and the the erosion of uh, human agency, the um, the, so uh, so let's talk about that a little bit. You know, what what are the real causes for concern? Yeah. So I've just described to you a sequence in an economic logic from the unilateral claiming of private human experience uh, ultimately to be sold quite profitably in uh, markets that trade in human futures. And you point out that, you know, these, these, the first experience that all of us had of this new logic takes place pretty much in the online environment with targeted ads. And the, the funny thing about your description is that if, if this, we're speaking right now in the year 2019. If we were having this conversation in the year 2005, even 2004, 2005, I, I would bet you that our conversation would be different because back, because back then, you know, folks experiencing what you just described felt really, really uncomfortable with it and disturbed 
you will recall, because I know you study this, that in 2004, when Google came out with Gmail, which was a massive step forward in email functionality, you know, endless storage because stuff was going to be stored on the, on the cloud and not on your computer and so forth, uh, ability to search within your emails, all kinds of things that um, were breakthroughs for the, for the whole email domain. And then uh, suddenly <laughs> people were seeing ads like the ones you're talking about, Russ, but they were ads that were triggered by something that you wrote in an email. Yep. And very quickly, uh, the, the ball of yarn unraveled and it became clear that uh, uh, Google, and we, we haven't gotten into our economic imperatives yet, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but Google was now using email content as a new source of raw material, as I've described, from which it would be able to scrape predictive signals. Uh, and these now email uh, all, all messages, all the email content that we produce was now feeding these supply chains of behavioral surplus. That's essentially that was hap what was happening. And of course, all of this occurs and this is where we compare it to the jackboots. All of this occurs remotely. All of this occurs through the medium of digital architectures. It's 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 not you know somebody coming and 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 threatening you with a gun. So it's all happening in this remote robotized medium. Nevertheless, the the yarn unravels and it quickly becomes clear that. These guys are scraping our emails <laughs> for more behavioral surplus to target ads. And people all over the world, as you will recall, Russ, were mobilized in outrage. Such was the outrage that um, an important California legislator immediately drew up uh, legislation to outlaw this unilateral taking of private human experience. What I just what I just wrote to my to my mom in an email. Okay. Uh, and what happened? The the Google team mobilized and it created a war room and it was there in the heat of that Gmail contest that they first developed the uh, the strategies and the sequence of of tactical operations that they would use over and over again uh, across the last fifteen years, Russ. And that uh, operation goes like this: the first thing is step one is what I call incursion. In other words, they take what they want. They take your email, they, you know, when it came to Street View, they take your house. If they can get Wi-Fi data out of your house, they take that too. They just take what they want until somebody tries to stop them. When somebody tries to stop them, they go into phase two, which is called habituation. Habituation is they try to draw out the process of contest for as long as possible. During that time, they're trying to, they're using backstage operations to try and stop any real impediment. But uh, what they're doing publicly is they're explaining, they're apologizing, they're saying, well, we'll do this, we'll do that. And uh, they, you know, they may be fielding court cases, they may be fielding hundreds of court cases, they let those court cases, you know, go, drag on for as long as possible. And suddenly the weeks and months and years start drifting by. If at the end of that time, uh, there is still any kind of protest, they will make some superficial adaptations. In many cases, by the end of this habituation period, People can no longer remember why they were so upset in the first place. <laughs> they, 
because this is what happens. Habituation sets in. You know, we certain things that were that violated norms, that violated boundaries, that we that we greeted as outrageous. Uh, you know, they become fixed fixed things in our life. It's like we're seeing that so much in the political domain now. You know, boundaries that could never be crossed, norms that could never be violated. Now, when they're violated routinely. Uh, we grow numb. This is called psychic numbing. We grow numb to these outrages, and that is what allows habituation and normalization to set in. Let me let, so, me, let me challenge that a little bit, or give a different maybe framework for it, okay? And and let you um, tell me why this is not representative. Uh, so I, I am alarmed by by some of this, particularly in the political realm, and I think. You know, the ability of Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, to control what I see and read uh, is is very concerning. And um, robots and other things that stir up anger and tribalism, I think, are not good for our country. And how we deal with that is a very tough question. And we're going to come to that, I hope, toward the end. But let me, let me give you a, a different um, framework for this. So my – my washing machine breaks. Now, a washing machine is an expensive thing to repair. I may need a new one. It may not be worth repairing. But let's say a guy comes to my – I have a – there's a new service available. And what the guy says is that uh, – I, I, here's the deal. I'm going to come to your house. I'm going to either fix your washing machine or give you a new one. No charge. Wow, fantastic. The only thing, though, is that I am going to – when I'm in your house, I'm going to take some pictures of the inside of your house. And I'm going to use those to – learn about you, and I'm going to sell some of that information to other people to help send you targeted ads and other things. So they come into my house. They find other things that are broken. Uh, they may see that I love wine or that I like to read or that I'm a photographer. And so I start getting in my mail, I start getting ads for cameras and ads for wine. I can get over, over the internet and uh, special book offers and so on. Oh, and then they say, oh, by the way, uh, you know, I, I'll also let's say I'm going to give you free. I'm going to give you a, a, your choice of free wine every week. But but if you're going to if you do that, I'm going to have to to get that service. You're going to have to let me um, see who you mail stuff to. Okay, and they start doing that, and eventually, yeah, I love inexpensive wine or fr wine without charge. I love having my my washing machine repaired with no charge or getting a a new one. And these incursions into my privacy of taking a few pictures, it's true, and I don't leave everything out, obviously, when I know the washing machine guy's coming, but they do take advantage of the fact that they wander through my house. And there's just something <laughs> deeply creepy about it, right? And I don't, and by the way, I, I should have made it even clearer. They don't really tell me that's what they're going to do, they just do it. So oh, I just okay. think, oh, that's a big, that's a big difference. Right? Of course. I, I get, so it's like, <laughs> oh, a free washing machine. And then I notice I'm getting a lot of ads for cameras, and I think, I guess that washing machine guy used the chance to be in my house to notice I have a lot of photographs up and knows I like photography, et cetera, et cetera. And so I have a choice right now to, to use these services. Now, I agree it's really hard to give them up. I am habituated to them. I love them. There are many of them. Not all of them. Many of them I love, though. Uh, I love ways. It's just it's really improved the quality of my life. really enjoy it. There are many other things I like about Gmail. It is a fantastic service. And the deal, and here's the pro part of the problem, was that there was never an explicit deal. The implicit deal was, oh, by the way, while you're using these, quote, free services, they're not really free because lots of reasons. I'm going to use your data. I'm going to charge advertisers for the opportunity to buy, to get access to you, which means the price is going to be higher than it otherwise would be. But I have a choice. And if you ask me, how do you like it? Well, I don't like it that they take pictures of my house when I'm in here. It is kind of creepy. But I do like the services a lot. And here's the key point. Nothing really horrible has happened, so I put up with it. And I think it's basically a good deal for me. And I would argue that for uh, young Americans in particular listening to this program, which there are many, they think a lot of this concern about privacy and data, some of them, people just don't even get it. But for me, it bothers me. I find it alarming, and particularly in the political realm, because it could change how people vote and what they do. But is it really as as 
frightening again, concerning. Uh, isn't it mainly successful? Not because they have power, because I've given them that power, because I like the deal. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I, l- let's talk about uh, two things, if because I need to lay out some terms of reference so I can really answer your question. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is what puts the surveillance in surveillance capitalism? Uh, why is it called surveillance capitalism? And the second thing is um, let's talk about the economic imperatives here. Because unless our listeners, and especially our young people who are listening, uh, and, and, and if you're listening to this, uh, listen up close, because, um, because this, this is about your future, and, uh, and you are the person that I'm most concerned about in this conversation. Um, so I want to talk about the economic imperatives, and I think that will give us a framework, Russ, for then coming back to your example and and looking at it uh, through some other lenses. Is that okay with you? Sure, go ahead. Okay. So the, the first thing I want you to know is why is it called surveillance capitalism? <clears throat> so this takes us back to uh, the, the early invention of surveillance capitalism at Google. I, I, I don't need to go into all the de- details of this origin story, Russ, if if you um, you know if you don't need me to, um, suffice to say that <coughs> in the heat of financial emergency during the dot com meltdown in the early 21st century, the years 2000 2001, Google, uh, like most other startups in Silicon Valley, faced tremendous investor pressure. Startups were going bust left and right. Really smart people were losing their businesses. They could not monetize fast enough uh, for the uh, demands of the impatient capital uh, represented by the um, the the venture capital firms that largely (laughs) led led investment in the valley. They weren't making any money. They they had a search engine that was fabulous that kept gaining market share, but they weren't they hadn't monetized anything, and and there wasn't obvious that they could and i think well, you should carry on so your story is exactly that, that's right that's true but, but don't don't forget that amazon uh wasn't turning a profit for quite a while um but uh you know but ultimately became an extremely successful business well, the revenue uh, which which helps at this point i don't think google had much of any revenue well they didn't but they had um very uh substantial plans on the table. There were different models being considered. There were, you know, there, there was a, 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 an intense and creative discussion about how these problems were going to be tackled. So it's, it's not like they were just, you know, sitting back and twiddling their thumbs, uh, sure. you know, happy to be doing search and, and nothing else. There were um, a range of alternatives on the table. But they didn't have time to explore those alternatives because when the dot-com bubble burst, the pressure rose. And even though it was uh, widely understood that Google had the, the best search engine and many people considered it to have you know, the, the, the smartest founders, uh, even under those conditions, it's, it's very sophisticated venture backers were threatening to, uh, to pull out. So it, it, here was a situation where the, you know, the founders had publicly rejected advertising. They regarded advertising as something that would disfigure search, disfigure uh, the internet in general. And, um, but now uh, in, in the heat of financial emergency, they essentially declared a state of exception. And uh, again, without going into a ton of detail, uh, people in the company knew that there were collateral streams of behavioral data that were being produced when people searched and browse, data that was not being used for the improvement of the search engine or the creation of new services like spell checking and translation and so forth. These data were were sitting around unorganized on servers 
these uh, data were referred to as digital exhaust or data exhaust. A few people had been experimenting with the data and began to understand that it had a lot of predictive value in it. Anyway, long story short, state of exception uh, induced the founders to now turn to these abandoned data logs to mine them for their predictive signals, to compute them with their advanced computational capabilities that even back then they referred to as their AI, uh, and to come up with the first major prediction product, which was the click-through rate. And that became the, the new model for the ad market. Until then, the model was uh, pretty continuous with the way advertising had been in the past, in the sense that advertisers were still picking where their ads went. And so in that choice, there was the continuity of, of still you know, trying to align where your ad appears with the brand values of your ad. Of your of your of the, of the company whose ad it is, okay. So so now all that changes, and Google says, you know, we've got a black box. We're not going to let you see inside the black box. But if you buy the product that comes out of the black box, you're going to make more money, and so are we. That was extremely successful. So successful, by the way, that uh, between 2000 and 2004, with their IPO documents going public. The first time we got to learn exactly uh, what the impact of this new logic was, and the impact was a revenue increase of three thousand five hundred and ninety percent just during those years, two thousand two thousand four. All right, they quickly understood that these leftover data, these behavioral surplus, uh, were available in all kinds of places hidden in the online environment. And uh, this was a very fertile time for patents coming out of Google. And when you read some of those patents, and I discuss some of them in my book, uh, it's very clear uh, you know, what the data scientists are, are, are saying, what they're celebrating. First of all, they're celebrating the fact that they can now hunt and capture behavioral surplus from all over the web. And they can use those surplus to learn things about, quote, users that folks did not intend to disclose. They can also use those surplus data to, um, to aggregate and create inferences that give them insights into people uh, that people did not intend to disclose. So that's number one. Number two was they celebrated the fact that they could do this while, while they're with methods that were undetectable. Undetectable. Because they understood that if users knew what they were doing, there would be resistance. And resistance means friction, and refri friction slows this whole thing down. So... Uh, from the start, there was an intentional, explicit uh, strategy of making sure that these methods were backstage methods, were indecipherable and undetectable. In other words, designed to keep people in ignorance of what was really going on backstage. That's why the Google uh, Gmail example is, is so interesting because the uh, the backstage operation broke through quite quickly there, whereas uh, before that, they had managed to keep this stuff um, very, very hidden. Okay, so, so right from the start, we're beginning here with the social relations of the one-way mirror. They can see us, we can't see them. They can see us, we can't see them seeing us, and so forth. All right, I'm I'm putting this out there now because it's going to be it's going to be very important to come back to this in a minute. <laughs> so I want to establish this as something that was baked into the cake, yep, right, right, right from the beginning. Okay, so now we talked about the fact that these prediction products, beginning with the click through rate, are sold into markets that trade in human futures. I'd like to talk about this for a moment because. You know, one way to look at, at 
uh, what I what I've done in this book, uh, especially in in parts one and two, is to reverse engineer the competitive dynamics of these markets. If you've got businesses who are competing in selling the human future, what is the nature of that competition and what kinds of imperatives emerge from those competitive dynamics? So you got to think about this this way. What are these businesses selling? They're selling certainty. They're not selling certainty about, you know, oil futures or pork bellies or whatever. They're selling certainty about future human behavior. They are trying to get as close as possible to being able to guarantee outcomes to their business customers. But isn't that my, but my question is on the surface, that's good for me. So there's, again, I'm I'm sympathetic to your view, but you could argue this is no different than what's happened to uh, advertising in the past. So somebody had a genius idea to advertise beer, not say during daytime soap operas, but during sports events. Now that's because someone had the insight that beer drinkers or people who watch sporting events are more likely to be beer drinkers than people who watch daytime soap operas. That's okay. There's nothing bad about that. In particular, there's something good about it. I'm watching the game and I see something I actually care about. And similarly, this idea, of, I, I think the confidence in Silicon Valley of their ability to predict human behavior is way overstated, but let's give them that assumption that it's true. The fact that they know what I want that should be a, on the surface a feature and not a bug. The fact that my uh, that the advertisers uh, who send me stuff or people that I want to buy is better than get, sending me ads for things I'm not interested in. So I, I, I don't see why there's anything uh, alarming about this. Now, I, about that, I think there are alarming things. In particular, I think your insight that the product is no longer – what I'm consuming, I'm consuming the search engine or the Gmail, but the profit is elsewhere. It, the real consumer of those for, for profit reasons is the advertiser, and that creates a gap, obviously, and, and the, the normal feedback loops of, of markets aren't there. So that's disturbing, and yet no one's actually disturbed except professors right now in the commercial part of it, as far as I can tell. They're concerned about the political part big time, but in the fact that these – searches and and my online activity is profitable be, for Google because they can sell me they can sell someone else access to me doesn't seem to harm me and that, that's what I'm pushing you on where's the well, harm you're, you're pushing me but you're not letting me finish my points so I, I want to lay out economic imperatives because that gives me the framework for responding to this um, uh, your complaint that this is that this is no big deal uh, and, and just as an aside, I would say, you know, the, the very thought of comparing this to advertising earlier in the 20th century or advertising in the, in the 19th century, you know, the, it, it, that's just silly because, yeah, of course, no, there is no argument here, Russ, that would say that, um, you know, persuasion is something new to the human experience. Persuasion is as old as humanity. There's, there, there, there's no, uh, there's nothing new about uh, people wanting to persuade one another to do the things that they'd like them to do. Of course, but uh, the situation here is utterly different because the situation here uh, revolves around companies that have amassed uh, enormous amounts of capital. And these capital fund a digital architecture that has become increasingly ubiquitous and increasingly global. And this digital architecture is the basis for uh, these huge asymmetries of data information, knowledge, and ultimately the power that accrues to that knowledge. These are not just hidden persuaders. These are hidden persuaders with billions, billions of, of, uh, of, of, of dollars deep 
capital resources who are funding and controlling a digital architecture and the data that flows through it to an extent that it is now not an exaggeration to say that the internet is owned and operated by surveillance capital. So, you know, I just don't think that, you know, the analogies to historical advertising uh, work, work here at all. We need to be able to recognize discontinuity when it's real. And here, historically, materially, there is uh, a, a profound discontinuity, and that's, that's where the concern begins. And by the way, this is not an argument about digital technology. My argument is not about digital technology. And I, and I know you've read my book, and so I know you appreciate that, because my argument is just the opposite. We entered the digital era uh, looking for the resources, the support, the information, uh, the individualization in the economic world, in our in our in our roles as 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 certainly as as customers, uh, and and to a certain extent, you know, just in our roles in everyday life, just trying to live our everyday lives effectively, uh, which has become extremely difficult over the, over the past decades as uh, em- employment has become more competitive and wages have stagnated or diminished and families are under great pressure, um, uh, students are under great pressure. So, you know, we went to the internet looking for these resources that would be the that would be the counterpoint, in a sense, the antidote to the institutional uh, pressures that that we feel throughout our lives. And we deserve that. We deserve digital technology. We deserve the individualization, the personalization. We deserve the um, the data that allows us to live more effectively. We deserve the connection. We deserve the voice, all of that. And indeed, at a societal level, we deserve the, quote, big data that allows us to understand, you know, the, the patterns of disease and, and more quickly and effectively tackle uh, chronic problems like cancer and diabetes, uh, chronic social problems, climate catastrophe, you know, the digital, the promise of the digital is something that we all deserve. My argument is that we deserve it without the strings that are attached uh, that begin with privacy, but go far beyond privacy. So that's where the economic imperatives come in. And I'm going to, I'm going to try and do this um, quite quickly Simply to say, where I was before, we look at we look at the idea of markets and human futures, and the competitive dynamics of those markets actually um, produce uh, a, a set of uh, of predictable and now deeply institutionalized economic imperatives. Okay, the first one is pretty obvious. We know if we're gonna if we're gonna feed machine intelligence with data in order uh, to come up with predictions, we need a lot of data. So the first imperative has to do with extracting behavioral surplus at scale. We need economies of scale. <clears throat> uh, you, you, you may remember that um, just last year, there was a, um, a Facebook memo that was leaked and in that Facebook memo, we got a we got a little bit of a window into the the production process, the new means of production at Facebook, and that's their AI hub. And among other things, uh, in that memo, I you know by the time I I saw this document, I was my my book was complete. I I think at the time I was finishing revisions and in, in just the, in the concluding chapter. So all of the things I've, I've said to you were, were already, you know, conceptualized and written about and so forth. But here in this document, 
they describe, you know, what do we do in the AI hub? And, uh, and what they say is we produce, quote, predictions of user behavior, unquote. That's what they, that's what they produce. And it talks about the trillions of data points that are ingested by the AI on a daily basis. And the AI's capacity to now produce six million predictions of behavior per second. Six million predictions per second. So when we're talking about economies of scale, <laughs> this is a very serious business to be able to you know, to be able to have these uh, flows on conveyor belts of trillions of data points and, uh, and to be able to produce 6 million predictions per second. This is serious economies of scale. Okay. In the, in the second phase of competition, the insight was scale is essential, but it's not enough. We also need scope. We need varieties of data. In order to get varieties of data, we have to leave behind this online environment that we've been talking about, Ross. We need to get people out into the world, and we need to follow them into the world. We need to know where they are and where they're going, who they're going with, what are they buying, what are they eating, what are they doing, where are they driving, what are they doing in their car. We need to know as much as we can about the different environments in which they're operating their homes, their automobiles, the city streets, so forth. So this is now scope. Also, the more we can know about how they feel, the better we can predict their future behavior. So we want their faces because that gives us the ability to analyze the thousand muscles in the face that actually produce um, very accurate, affective predictions. And we want to be able to see people, not just who's on the street, but how are their, what's the angle of their shoulders, their posture, their gait. All of these things become crucial sources of behavioral surplus. So we give people little computers to carry in their pockets, to take with them out into the world. The apps on those computers are constantly streaming and in a, again, hidden behind the one-way mirror. You download a diabetes app, it grabs your contacts, some of them grab your camera, some of them grab your microphone, all of them grab your location, all of them streaming those data to the third parties, and most of those third parties are owned by Google and Facebook, but on to third parties and more third parties and so forth. All right, so now we have your little pocket computer, and that is combined with sensors and cameras that are increasingly saturating public spaces, saturating our homes, our cars. These are the economies of scope. But in a third pay phase of competitive competition, of competitive dynamics, there's a new insight. And that insight is the most predictive behavioral data, the most predictive signals are achieved when we can actually intervene in the state of play actually begin to actively now uh, tune and herd human behavior in the direction of those guaranteed outcomes that we seek. So this is new because anybody in the business world has heard of economies of scale, heard of economies of scope, but this is something new and it mirrors what the data scientists describe in the um, in the world of the Internet of Things as the shift from monitoring to actuation. So the idea becomes you know, that, the, that the technological architecture isn't just producing data flows about what's going on, but it's actually enabling feedback loops so that uh, we can affect what's going on. We can not only monitor, but we can affect it. So that's the shift from monitoring to actuation. And that's what we're seeing here in these competitive dynamics. So this is what I call economies of action. But what's this wrong is... with all this? I mean, I, I'm, <laughs> I, 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 those are all – those are great descriptions of, I think, how the online world has become uh, profit streams for different aspects of, of our lives. And I'm 64 years old, 
I find it somewhat either unnerving or disturbing. I can imagine consequences of this that are uh, very negative. But right now, they aren't. Most people, I would argue, think this is great. I can turn, and if I don't like it, I can turn off location on my my phone, which I often do because I'm 64 and I don't like it. I don't have Alexa in my house uh, for that reason. I don't like that it's listening. I'm not sure why I should care, but I don't like it, so I don't do it. Um, if I wanted to, I could not use a lot of these things and 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 get by without them. Now, I would argue that I think that most of the people, again, listening, love these things. They don't. They don't. Not only do they not find them concerning, they like them. So you, I'd like you to try to argue why they shouldn't. Uh, and in particular, if you if you don't like them, and if you think they are bad, you're going to have to come up with another way to get those things you think we deserve, because someone's got to pay for them. They're not free. Now, mm-hmm. I, you, you were arguing, essentially, we made a deal with the devil. And you might be right, and I'm worried about it. But it's not obvious, I think, to most listeners that that's the case. So try to convince them. Well, as I as I've said, um, and uh, you know, and so I'm I'm in the middle of of describing w- economies of action and how these are achieved, because economies of action are something new under the sun. This is again, this is not the persuasion of old. Um, this is persuasion now that has to be effected, actuated through the medium of the digital architecture. So, so this is this is a new kind of problem, a new kind of challenge, and this required some experimental work. And uh, I have to hypothesize that most of the experimental work uh, has happened uh, consistently hidden from the public, but there's some of the experimental work that that comes through to the public view. So let's talk about that for a moment. Uh, one prominent domain of this experimental work was at Facebook. And we got wind of this in 2012 when Facebook published what it called its uh, massive scale contagion experiment. So that means massive scale means at the scale of populations, contagion experiment. And what they did in 2012 uh, was to see if they could use subliminal cues on Facebook pages to affect uh, real-world behavior, in this case, uh, getting more folks to go vote in the midterm elections. Uh, When the news broke about that, again, there was a wave of outrage around the world, and Facebook went into its usual process of making apologies and so on and so forth. As they were doing that, the ink was drying on a second massive scale contagion experiment. This one was designed, again, to use subliminal cues on their pages to see if they could make people feel happier or sadder. All right. In both cases, uh, these studies were published in um, very prestigious scholarly journals. And when they were published, the researchers celebrated two facts. And this is where I want our listeners to remember the, the, the patents from the early 21st century that I described before in the one-way mirror. So now we're in 2012, 2013, and what the researchers celebrated in both of these um, scholarly articles were two facts. Number one, we now know that we can use subliminal cues in the online environment to affect, to actuate real world behavior and feeling, emotion. That was number one. Number two, we now know that we can do that in ways that completely bypass user awareness. Undetectable, methods that are undetectable. Okay, so this is, this is experiment in economies of action that are happening, hiding in plain sight in Facebook. Now, a few years later, we come to understand that Google, the other pioneer of surveillance capitalism, uh, because, by the way, Google 
invented surveillance capitalism, but the first company that it migrated to, folks should know, was Facebook. It quickly became the default economic model for the, the tech sector, but by now is spreading across the normal economy. So we're seeing this economic logic in insurance and in, in retail and health and education and finance across many sectors coming full circle now back to production. We can, we can talk about that later if we need to. All right. So now we see um, in Google that there's also been several years of experimenting how to achieve economies of action. Google chose to bring its experimentation to the world through an augmented reality game called Pokemon Go. Pokemon Go was incubated in Google for many years. It was developed by a man named John Hankey, who had, before that had been the boss of Street View. Before that, Google Earth. He was the invention of the satellite system Keyhole, which became the basis for Google Earth uh, when Google bought it from the, the CIA and Hankey came, came with it to, uh, to Google. He was someone who had... Uh, a long history of rejecting the claims of uh, folks in towns and cities who didn't like street view cars uh, coming through their neighborhoods and and uh, capturing their their houses and their their uh, neighborhoods for for Google Maps. Okay, so this is uh, John Hankey. Uh, many years with his uh, laboratory inside Google called Niantic Labs, uh, developing this augmented reality game, and then at the very last minute, spun off from Google, brought to market as though Niantic Labs was an independent company. Of course, its primary investor remained Google. Uh, what we learned about Pokemon Go, and most people know Pokemon Go is a huge worldwide success, a lot of folks went out and <laughs> looked for Pokemon creatures. Families did it, you know, getting out through the city and the parks on the streets and so forth. What we learned eventually about Pokemon Go was that Pokemon Go was an experiment in economies of action. In this case, Niantic Labs was hosting its own futures markets. It had establishments, well-known establishments, institutions from McDonald's to Starbucks, but also, you know, Joe's Pizza and the tire place in town. Uh, these establishments were paying fees to Niantic Labs uh, in, the, in, a, in the analogous to online advertisers, but in this case, they're not asking for click-through rates, which would be the online equivalent. In the real world now, with real life and real bodies, they're asking for footfall. They want the actual bodies with the real feet on their floors in their establishments. And what the game did was it used the incentives intrinsic to the game to learn how to herd people through the city to the establishments that were paying Niantic Labs for footfall, guaranteed outcomes. Now, none of this was, uh, was known to the public when, when it was happening. It was, uh, it was surfaced later and came out in, in an FT article initially that, uh, where Hanky was interviewed. And, um, and even today, <laughs> the vast majority of people have no idea that uh, uh, Pokemon Go was, was monetized in this way. Okay, so here we have a basis now for uh, this um, highly capitalized experimental work, learning how to shift, shape, modify, tune, herd, direct human behavior in ways that are designed to be undetectable. Bypassing awareness. Bypassing awareness, what does that mean? Well, in psychology, psychologists talk about the fact that awareness is essential 
for what psychologists call self-determination. So you can't be a self-determining individual, an autonomous individual, without having awareness of the uh, of your of your situation and and of your own action. So here we now have surveillance capital uh, intervening in human behavior at scale, learning how to shape human behavior at scale in ways that are undetectable, which and and which are designed to bypass awareness. And you you know you're right to say that uh, people don't realize this, and maybe at the moment do not care. But a lot of the do not care phenomenon is explained by the fact that these operations are specifically designed to bypass our awareness, to keep us in ignorance, while entertaining us with the game, <laughs> entertaining us with the Pokemon creatures and so forth, entertaining us on our Facebook pages. But indeed, there are systematic, highly capitalized operations that are a direct response to economic imperatives. This is not James yeah. Bond with some, you know, evil empire cooking up this stuff. These are uh, people who are now um, committed to an economic logic that requires these kinds of practices. You mentioned ways a moment ago, and that it had in, that it enhances your quality of life, and I'm sure it does. But it's also important for folks to know that Waze is a Google application that is part of a, a larger um, uh, a, a, a larger vision of a smart city, uh, what Google used to call a Google city, uh, and how a smart city can function. And the Waze application right now uh, has also uh, uh, recently clarified that they too have established their own uh, futures markets. So they've got McDonald's and other establishments that are paying them yep. uh, to send uh, to send folks their way, uh, and that and these dynamics are not transparent. They're not disclosed to drivers. Yeah, but when I see the ad for McDonald's, I kind of figure, you know, I kind of get it. Uh, but <laughs> well, I, 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 Waze, Waze is priding itself on its ability to gather data about drivers that go far beyond, you know, uh, where you are on the highway right now in your commute. Sure. They're, they're, they have ambitious goals like you talk about. Many of them are, are going to be good for human beings and some of them probably are going to be good for Waze and Google and not so good for human beings. You know, right. when so we let, think about so let's, well, I'm, so I want to send us. Let, so let's go. Let's go back to your your fundamental challenge to me, which is, you know, why is this a cause for concern? So the 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 causes for concern here, first of all, what, you 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 see this you see this uh, um, progression from the subliminal cues, the uh, remote herding. Uh, now to the you know actual application and something like ways. This is these are the um, these are the mechanisms and methodologies that a company like Alphabet slash Google slash Sidewalk Labs. Th this is intrinsic to their vision of a smart city. The idea that now these um, computational uh, conclusions, these 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 uh, computational analyses, replace the uh, frictionful, messy, uh, uh, often conflictful back and forth of municipal governance and that you know we we run cities 
in this smooth, frictionless way uh, by having these immense data flows, the trillions of data points, the millions of predictions per second, and we compute and we can herd populations through the cities, through the towns. We can uh, tune and shape and modify in ways that maximize the outcomes that we seek. And of course, the problem is that this is being this is being prosecuted under the aegis of private capital, specifically private surveillance capital. There is no democracy here. There is no self-determination here. There is no uh, shared citizen solidarity, governance, democratic power here. This is a completely different kind of future and a different kind of solution for our future that is profoundly anti-democratic. So let me come back to the concerns. What are your concerns, Shoshana? Why are you concerned? When we put all the pieces together here, I said to you earlier, this is not uh, soldiers in jackboots coming to tear you from your bed in the dark of night. This is a different kind of power, and it's a power that is profoundly anti-democratic. And it erodes democracy from below and from above. It, de it erodes democracy from below because it's, its own economic imperatives produce a requirement for economies of action, behavioral modification of populations at scale, all of it mediated by a digital architecture, which is now hijacked by this economic logic. And this di digital architecture is the means through which power operates remotely. But this is a direct assault on human autonomy, on human agency. And it wasn't that long ago that within our own government, there, were, there was a clear understanding that these kinds of methods and mechanisms by, by impinging on human autonomy violate individual sovereignty, are a threat to freedom, and actually all of our thinking about the, the fabric of a democratic society and what is required for democracy, all of our thinking turns on the idea that we have people who are, uh, who, who, who have fundamental agency, who can be self-determining. But now we're looking at global architectures that are aimed at those human capabilities. Okay. Well, let me, let me how, wait, wait, hang on. How does hang, it? Shoshana, hang on one sec. Sure. I, I, I want to take us in a, we don't have a lot of time left, and I want to make sure we talk about something we haven't talked about, uh, which is, that's all interesting, could be true. Uh, and as I said, I'm somewhat worried about it. I will observe that the, democratic process that currently runs our cities is not terribly successful. I think that's worth mentioning, but I certainly don't want to replace it with a corporate run alternative without competition. Certainly one of the challenges of these, of the profit motive in the, in the realm you're talking about is that competition is what usually protects consumers from the uh, rapacious aspect of the profit motive, and without that competition, we are vulnerable. And I think there is a serious concern there in these in these areas that that's real. But now the question, the harder question is: Let's say you're right. Now what? What, what do you want to do about it? Do you have an idea of other than the fact that you don't like that the profit motive? And I I agree. It is it is consuming. It is out there. It is encouraging the monetization of all kinds of things. It's the way of the world um, in most in modernity. Should we stop it? Should we create a foundation that runs our search engine? Should we create a utility that's run by government that oversees these organizations? Should we break them up? So, you know, 
Or should we just have people who write books and have podcasts who encourage people to look for alternatives that are less uh, disturbing, which would be a, another way that we solve these problems historically. What are your thoughts? Well, look, the, the big picture here and, um, and, and the, the, the other angle through which to, to really understand the threats to democracy is that we're, we're about to enter the third decade of the 21st century. And our expectation was that in this digital future, uh, we would be enjoying the democratization of knowledge and all the emancipatory potential of the digital. In fact, and this is um, this this relates to your your theme of competition. In fact, we're entering this third decade uh, with a social pattern marked by asymmetries of knowledge and power that that actually harken back to a a pre-modern kind of societal pattern, a pre-Gutenberg societal pattern. Now, we, we have a very strange situation on our hands. Nearly all of the world's information has shifted from analog to digital. And yet we only have a handful of institutions and, and in that very short list, <laughs> they're all private, privately owned surveillance capitalists. A handful of institutions who are even capable of computing the vast amounts of data that exist. So when we talk about you know the trillions of data points uh, per day and the six million predictions per second, we're talking about asymmetries of knowledge that are intolerable for a democracy. Okay, so are we gonna fix this by breaking the companies up? Are we gonna fix this by imposing privacy law? Are we gonna fix this by creating government-run utilities? These are all amazingly important questions. My view is this. Uh, People say, oh gosh, uh, you know, and I, I learn about this and I, I, I feel so depressed and I feel helpless and I feel resigned and, and you know, how are we ever going to fix this? I feel differently. I feel extremely optimistic about our situation. And the reason is that we haven't even tried to fix it yet. Surveillance capitalism is 19 years old. During those 19 years, it has essentially been unimpeded by law. It has had a, it has had a free run. Uh, I have a, a section in chapter 11 of my book where I, where I ask, the, ask the question, how do they get away with it? And I answer it with 16, 16 reasons that are analyzed in depth in the book. The point is that key among those reasons is that uh, these operations have been so unprecedented, so hidden, our ignorance has been uh, so comprehensive that uh, we haven't uh, created the kind of law or regulatory frameworks that uh, would tame this, th these operations and, and tether these destructive uh, aspects of these operations, you know, tether this capitalism to the real demands of, of a, a flourishing democratic society. All right, so if we were gonna talk about law, what kind of law would we talk about? Well, privacy law is incredibly important here. In privacy law, people begin with principles of data ownership data portability, data accessibility. The problem here is that while we may get ownership and access to the kinds of data that we give these platforms, we are not going to get access or ownership to the kinds of data that they produce within their production processes. 
we're not getting access to those trillions of data points. We're not getting access to those six million predictions per second. So privacy law is important, but doesn't take us far enough. Antitrust law. There are many, many grounds on which surveillance capitalists are also ruthless capitalists. And there are serious problems of monopoly and uh, anti-competitive behavior. And we need to, uh, we need to, uh, uh, to get serious about these dynamics. And there is a lot more discussion today, as you know, Ross, about uh, sort of, you know, awakening the sleeping giant of antitrust law uh, in the, uh, pointed at the tech sector. My concern is that uh, to a certain extent, antitrust law is designed to respond to the harms of, uh, that we encountered in the late 19th and the 20th century and not respond to the new and unprecedented mechanisms and methods that we've been discussing associated with surveillance capitalism. Yeah, I agree. And 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 here I don't I think, think it's designed for it, and I don't think it gets at the heart of the problem, which is to well, me it's the property it, rights problem. But I, you know, there's obviously different ways of looking at it. Yeah. So you know, and what we don't want to do is break up, for example, you know, break up a Facebook, break break up a Google, and end up with you know four or five smaller surveillance capitalists. Uh, which will simply, you know, create more competitive opportunity in the field. So increasing competition for more surveillance capitalism <laughs> isn't going to solve the problems that we've been talking about. So well, it, here, it might if it's possible, which is uh, to take an observation from Arnold Klang. Uh, you have a lot of smart friends. Uh, you probably have more than I do. I have a couple, but you have a bunch. Been at Berkman. You have a lot of talented people there. There are a lot of people at in Silicon Valley who are uneasy about the state of these things. Why won't they start a a Google or a Facebook that doesn't have these characteristics from the beginning, as like DuckDuckGo well, at least claims to do, and, well, and, yeah, make, that, uh, and collect all that data for good reasons, good purposes, make them public, don't hide behind the black box. So get donations rather than profits or get users to pay fees rather than monetizing their behavioral surplus, wouldn't that work? Well, th this is what I'm saying, Russ, um, that if we're breaking up companies but not challenging with law and with alternative regulatory frameworks, not challenging the fundamental mechanisms and methods I've been describing, then we leave the field open for a more intensified competition uh, among surveillance capitalists and new surveillance capitalist entrants because we haven't confronted these mechanisms and methods. So my, the next step in my reasoning is that beginning to think freshly for the 21st century for these unprecedented conditions about what law and regulation might look like, that then opens the space for the competitive solutions that we desperately need. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. I described the sequence that begins with claiming uh, private human experience as free raw material and ends with uh, the, the uh, dynamics of uh, human futures markets. I think there are opportunities to intervene in the front end and in the back end that would make a substantial difference and open up the field for the kinds of competitors who want to um, you know, sort of re, uh, um, uh, redirect our trajectory toward the digital future <laughs> in a way that produces the, the 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 good outcomes that we seek without the costs that we've been discussing. So, for example, if we uh, if we got real about saying that uh, you are not allowed to take my experience, for example, uh, right? You know, 
you may you may know that uh, a couple of years ago there was a multi-stakeholder process that was hosted by the Commerce Department. You had the NGOs, you had the companies, you had the government trying to agree on facial recognition. And the, the talks broke down because the companies insist that they should be allowed to have cameras and sensors on the streets that can take what they want, translate it into their facial recognition software, and have our faces. They insist that they have that right. And the government did not fight them on that. So I want to say uh, that that is fundamentally incorrect, that the companies have no right to my face and that I have a right to walk on the street without my face being taken without my knowledge, therefore certainly without my permission, and used in whatever way they choose. So this is, this is right at the beginning of this process that we say, no, you can't simply take people's experience and you can't do it in a way that is hidden and deprives them of decision rights. Okay, at the back end, we can say, uh, we uh, outlaw markets that trade exclusively in human futures. Why not? Because everything that I have described to you arises from the competitive dynamics of these markets. So we say we, we, do, not, uh, we do not allow markets that trade in slavery. We say uh, we outlaw markets that trade in human organs. Uh, why not say we outlaw markets that trade in human futures? Because these markets, and you, you said something really important before, Russ, and we didn't really come back to it, but these, these markets, these are not the markets that uh, uh, Schumpeter, when Schumpeter talked about creative destruction, which, as you know, has become a sort of banner for all of this activity, he talked about creative destru destruction as like a small and tragic consequence of a larger uh, creative process. Creative destruction was the, was the unfortunate consequence of what he called a creative response. And the creative response was supposed to be an economic mutation that really moved the dial of economic history. And his standards for that were very clear. You know, his standards for that were, were that economic, you, you can tell an economic mutation from just another innovation because it's such a profound breakthrough that it really uh, benefits all of society. It lifts all boats. It raises the standard of living for the great majority of people. This is not how surveillance capitalism operates. It's, it's, it's profits circulate. In a, in a very narrow domain of the companies, their shareholders, their, their business customers who operate uh, and gain value from these futures markets. But, but these are not profits that circulate back into the economy. These are not profits that build a middle class or that, you know, uh, help us uh, fund our, our public education system or anything else. These are... These are markets where the, the, the revenues are essentially parasitic because they're based on taking raw material from us without asking. But we do get something in return, and that we return get, goes to every, almost every single person, rich and poor. They all watch YouTube. They all are using <laughs> Waze. They're all on email. All right. They're all so. using the Internet in their pocket. Everybody's got a smartphone, rich and poor, almost everyone. It's kind of extraordinary. So it's a complicated thing. And I agree with you that we need some new ways of thinking about it. But this is, what you're saying, Russ, is by design. That's the whole point. It's by design. The whole idea of free was by design yeah. in order to establish invariable, dependable supply chains. Yep. Yeah. Of behavioral surplus. So, you know, for example, you know, Android. When they when they developed Android at Google, there was a there was a, a bunch of people at Google who said, "Great, now we can finally we finally have something we can 
we can um, sell it with a hefty margin and we can finally compete with Apple. But other minds prevailed. And those minds said, no, 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 just the opposite. If we can give this away, let's give it away. Because this is going to be our most powerful supply chain interface. This is going to be the way, you know, we'll claim that it's the mobility revolution, and this is going to be the way that we stream data from all over the place. This is going to free us from the Yeah, I, yeah the and if, but if we didn't like all that streaming, we wouldn't use the free phone. That's that's the only point I but want to make. But that's not true, Russ, no? because we don't know about it. This is the fundamental issue. You know, I write about this uh, – this, um, research that was published in the um, American Journal of Medicine where they investigated a bunch of uh, health-related applications, specifically in this case diabetes applications, that are approved by the FDA because now the FDA actually approves certain applications. And they discovered that in, in this requires forensic analysis. People don't know this because it's designed so that they can't know it. Every single diabetes application that they reviewed was, first of all, streaming data to third parties that had nothing to do with the, with the health domain. And again, many of those domains, the majority of those domains, owned by Google and Facebook. But they're also doing other things. The second you even just download an application, a diabetes application, they're doing things like taking your contact list. In some cases, then they use the contact list to contact phones of your contacts, and they take those contact lists. Many of them commandeer the microphone, the camera, the uh, learn about other applications on your phone, your messages, your email. This is happening through these innocent, so-called innocent diabetes apps. No one knows that these things are going on. Well, now, no one knows. now they do. And I guess the question is, as you point <laughs> out, the question you point out is maybe we should change the regulatory environment so that it's we have to give them permission to share that information. And for better or for worse, I think many people will choose to give that information away. And I think a lot of what you're talking about, which, I, again, I'm sympathetic to, is our culture is part of this challenge. And we have to decide whether we're going to restrict the choices of individuals to give that data away through regulatory restrictions, which might be a good idea, or whether we're going to rely on people to choose to, to do it voluntarily or not. You know, there was a big stink at the beginning of this year that you had to get permission to use cookies. So now I get these annoying ads that's annoying, you know, information bars say, we use cookies on the site. Is that okay? And of course, I click yes. Maybe I shouldn't, but I do. Uh, I, I knew they were using cookies before, but now they're required by law. I think that's a mindless and unhelpful uh, regulation. But it, it gets at what this fundamental problem it's like, you know, It's like saying you've got to disclose. So we have a disclosure statement. It says, you know, you have to check this box. Nobody reads it. They don't want to. So I think All right. that, So l l let me just – I'm going to have to go. <clears throat> so, um, but I, I would like to just end on, on this one note that um, I appreciate what you're saying, but, but I don't think the research bears you out because when you, when you look at the research on uh, users going back to um, really, uh, you know, as early as like 2003, 4, 5, um, survey research, uh, other kinds of participant research, when people learn about these backstage operations, historically, they are appalled. Yep. They are outraged, and they don't want anything to do with them. Yeah. And Facebook lost a lot of users this year, and maybe they'll lose more. I don't use it. Uh, I, I don't recommend that people use it. I encourage people to do other things. It's a good point. I think so, we need more of that, probably. Yeah. And so, but then, you know, folks, despite those reactions, keep using. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> and and uh, and and so, you know, the companies have pointed to this over the years and said, see, kind of like what you're saying, you know, the people really like this and, and there's nothing wrong with what we're doing because people continue to participate. 
again, this is, you know, my, my part of my, you know, 16 reasons of how they got away with it. But, uh, but so, so this, this contrast between how people feel and then how they behave has been referred to as the privacy paradox. Yeah. But in fact, my argument is that it's not a paradox and it's not a paradox because, uh, we know what we want and we know what we reject, but we're living in a world where the alternatives have been systematically foreclosed so that it, I'm in a situation now where I want to get my kids grades from the school. I want to get my, uh, health results from my doctor's office. I want to organize dinner with my family, uh, friends at a, at a restaurant just for these basic operations of daily effectiveness, I am required to march through the same channels that are surveillance capitalism supply chains, yeah. where hidden operations are working on my action and are scraping my experience for predictive signals. And this is ubiquitous. So we're increasingly um, you know, in this world of, of no exit, and from an economic point of view, from a business point of view, from a competitive point of view, you know, it's hard not to see this as some kind of giant market failure. Because in fact, the, what it, the, the disconnect between supply and demand, to me, is a better explanation than to call it a, a privacy paradox. It's not a paradox, it's a disconnect. Because what people want is not aligned with what's on offer. And so my view is that if we actually got serious about these regulations that would bite on surveillance capitalism, that opens up the space for, for a new kind of competitor to come into the space, form alliances, create a new ecosystem that really takes us on a different path to the future. And that really, you know, sort of gets us back to the kind of thing that Schumpeter talked about, which is what, what is entailed for a, a healthy, flourishing capitalism that, uh, such that, you know, we can have the concept of a market democracy and it can make some kind of sense. My guest today has been Shoshana Zuboff. Her book is The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. Shoshana, thanks for being part of EconTalk. Thank you so much, Russ. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.